Hello. So today we're going to look at uh, chapter 15, which is entitled Microbial Mechanisms of Pathogenicity. Uh, this will be the first part of a three-part uh, lecture on this chapter. Um, and so let's look at the, the title of this chapter, Microbial Mechanisms of Pathogenicity. That's a mouthful. So what does this mean? Essentially, how do microbes uh, create or, or generate illness within their host? So we'll be looking at a variety of microbes, mainly bacteria, uh, and looking at the ways in which they create disease within their host. What do they do? What do they produce in, in, in order to um, derive their benefits in order to parasitize a host. So let's get started. So a couple of terms. Pathogenicity, the ability to cause disease. And we use this term uh, to, to rank um, pathogens, to rank those that are parasitizing us. One is more pathogenic than another. One produces a toxin that uh, is more pathogenic than another. So this can be a term that, that can be used in a comparative sense. And virulence is the extent of pathogenicity. How far, how virulent is that particular strain of bacteria, for example, if it's E. coli? Some, some strains of E. coli are more virulent than others. Some of them ha create no pathogenicity within us, and some create pretty, uh, pretty serious uh, illness within us. And so virulence is used to describe the extent and then what is disease? Well, the disease itself, which is an, an imbalance in homeostasis within an organism, the disease that's created by these microbes is often due to their, their waste products, especially the toxins that they produce, and not the microbes themselves. So the microbes will be living within us, and, and their numbers for quite some time are rather small. Um, but then their numbers begin to become immense, like with bacteria and their exponential growth. And once they reach a certain size and a certain number, they will begin to uh, generate toxins, release them, and, and create all sorts of, of different signs and symptoms within their hosts, which we'll discuss later. Those are called biofilms, uh, which will be in this chapter. So the disease that we experience is not necessarily from the microbes that are inhibiting us, but it's all the junk that they produce within us, and then our body responds in some particular way, whether it's, it's a, 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 an abundant release of cytokines, which creates inflammation and swelling and, and, and an allergic response uh, to, to a, a deadly point in, in some cases, or it, it causes us to, to have violent reactions such as vomiting or uh, copious amounts of diarrhea, for example. Um, it's these toxins that are stimulating and causing our bodies to respond in this way. And it depends on what the toxin is and, and where the toxin is, is tailored to be absorbed uh, into, what cells will take up that toxin, and then the cells will respond accordingly. And we'll be talking about that in this chapter as well. So one thing we want to look at are portals of entry, and we'll, we'll finish with portals of exit at the end of the chapter. So some portals of entry. Well, the mucous membranes of especially the respiratory tract, which is the most accessible and used portal in the body. Then the, the uh, gastrointestinal genitourinary tracts and the conjunctiva of the eyes. So these mucous membranes become uh, a, a very accessible point of entry for microbes, and many of them have cell membrane and cell wall components that will enable them to enter mucous membranes rather easily. Um, so they have adapted ways to, to get into our bodies that way, plus the, the fact that we have over, the, the average adult has over 4,000 square feet of mucous membrane. So for bacteria, this is, this is just a, a, a humongous surface area for them to access and gain entry into the body. They enter through the skin via our hair follicles and sweat glands, and so these are open little portals that are in our skin that the bacteria can uh, move and, and weasel their way into to get uh, into the skin and then into the into the bloodstream perhaps even. Um, if the 
defenses, the first and second lines of defense that we have are, are insufficient to prevent these microbes from gaining access into the circulatory system. So uh, microbes can gain access that way through the skin. Um, and related to the skin, the parenteral root. Microbes are deposited directly under the skin or mucous membranes. So if it's being deposited directly, then that would be through punctures. Um, say, like we always associate the rusty nail with tetanus, for example. Um, injections, bites from vectors like mosquitoes cuts, surgery, etc. So these are all different parenteral roots that microbes can gain access into the body. Many pathogens do have a preferred portal of entry. And as I said, these pathogens have developed um, all of these different ways and mechanisms of gaining access into the body. Some of them, even, even down to the specific type of mucous membrane, like the mucous membrane of the respiratory tract, like with Bordetella pertussis, for example. Um, the GI tract with, uh, say, for example, Salmonella, gaining access that way. So they have preferred portal, portals of entry. Uh, and the reason why is because of what's on their outside. What's covering a particular virus that enables it to get into a cell? Well, it's going to be the what's called the capsid or the envelope around the virus, uh, there's something on it that enables it to get into our cells. And our cells then take it in. Well, those are particular cells, whether it's of the respiratory tract or the, the genitourinary tract, for example. Um, so these microbes, these pathogens are gaining access in a particular way. And they often have a preferred portal of entry. Not that they prefer it themselves. This is just what they've adapted over eons of time in order to, to get into the body through uh, different routes. So one way that we can use, uh, a couple of ways, I guess, that we use uh, are, are to determine how virulent something is or, or the potency of a toxin are ID50 and LD50. ID50, the I is infectious, the D is dose, and then the 50 is for 50% of the test population. So ID50 is used as a comparison under different conditions, and it's an expression of a microbe's virulence. And I'll show you on the next slide what I mean by that. It, it, it kind of displays and shows clearly uh, how this is used as a, as a means of comparison. The LD50 is the lethal dose of a toxin that is for 50% of the test population. And so we're, we're measuring toxin potency between different species of bacteria. Uh, and so that's how the lethal dose is. So the infectious dose is used for one particular bacterium and how, through the different portals, um, how infectious is it? How virulent is it in those three different portals of entry? Whereas the LD50 is used to compare toxin potency between different species of bacteria. And it's not just toxins, and this is kind of an aside what I have here at the bottom, but there's an LD50 for just about any chemical compound and even water. Uh, water at, at six liters. Now, this is not over the course of you know, a day. Um, the LD50 for 50% of the population of water is six liters in, in a sitting. Caffeine, uh, 118 cups of coffee. I can't imagine drinking that much. That's, that's mind-boggling. Alcohol, uh, 13 shots of 80 proof, um, which would be like uh, Jack Daniels, for example, and, and other types of, of hard liquor. Uh, 13 shots in, in, right in a row. Uh, that would be the LD50 at 80 proof concentration. So let's look at bacteria though. So what I meant with the um, with the ID50 as you see in the top chart, we're looking at Bacillus anthracis, the causative agent for anthrax. So the portal of entry, there are three, and we're going to look at those three, and then how many endospores are required to cause an infectious dose in 50% of the population. With skin, it's 10 to 50 endospores, so small number, only 10 to 50 cells. An endospore is a, is a cell, it's a bacterial cell that's in a, in a spore, um, 
phase of its life, we'll say. Inhalation, uh, 10,000 to 20,000 endospores. And ingestion, you need quite a pile of them, 250,000 to a million endospores. So Bacillus anthracis, typically uh, um, we think of it as an, an inhalational pathogen, which it is. It's highly deadly um, if, if those spores are inhaled, but you need a large number of them. Uh, to develop an infectious dose for 50% of the population. So where does it appear? It appears in the skin and it's very easily contracted that way. And it's called, by the way, anthracis because of the, the black lesions that form on the skin. And it looks like it, it, it's as black as coal. And so we, there, there's a form of coal called anthracite. And that's why it's called anthracis, uh, because it looks like there's a, a lump of coal in your skin uh, surrounded by redness and inflammation and swelling. You can check out pictures of those online, of course, to see what I'm talking about. But anyway, what does this mean? In other words, what does this chart mean? What is it showing us? Well, it's showing us that cutaneous anthrax is far easier to acquire than inhalational or far more uh, easy, far easier to acquire than gastrointestinal. The bottom one is the LD50 chart. So we're looking at three different toxins, the botulinum toxin, the shiga toxin, and the staphylococcal toxin. Now the botulinum toxin, lethal dose for 50% of the population, look how small that is, three hundredths of a nanogram per kilogram. That, you can't even fathom something that small. The shiga toxin is very small as well, 250 nanograms per kilogram. And the staphylococcal toxin is 1350 nanograms per kilogram. So the, in fact, the, the botulinum toxin is the deadliest substance that we know of. There, there has been, there, there is nothing more toxic than the botulinum toxin on earth. It, it is the most toxic substance on earth and it's produced by um, Clostridium botulinum which is an obligate anaerobic bacterium. The shiga toxin uh, is produced by E. coli so when you hear about these E. coli outbreaks there's a strain of E. coli it's E. coli 0157H7 and that designation is the 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 enterotoxic E. coli and it produces a toxin that's called the shiga toxin. It's named after a Japanese scientist. And uh, it causes severe diarrhea. It can cause dysentery. Um, and it's, it's a severe toxin on the gastrointestinal system. And the staphylococcal toxin is, is uh, the toxin that is responsible for food poisoning, or a better term, I suppose, would be food intoxication. Um, all three of these create... Um, violent reactions within the body, uh, even, of course, death, as, as is obvious with the botulinum uh, toxin. So that's ID50 and, and LD50, and hopefully those two charts help you understand that a little more clearly. So how do they gain access? Well, they have these what are called adhesins and ligands on their cell walls, that bind to receptors on the host cell to gain access at portals of entry. So as I said a, a few minutes ago, that's how they gain access. They have these, um, these glycoproteins, these lipoproteins that are on their surface that enable them to gain access into their host cells. And what do we have on our cells? Carbohydrates. And so those carbs that are sticking up all over the surfaces of our cell membranes are used for a variety of purposes. And they're not supposed to be giving access to these pathogens, but the pathogens have, ad have adapted these adhesins and ligands to gain access into our cells, and they're using what's on the outside of our cell, carbohydrates, to get in. Um, these adhesins can be located at a number of places on them. Their cell wall, their, their pili, which are these cellular extensions that bacteria will use to exchange DNA in order to strengthen uh, bacteria that are around them. It's, it's not a means of reproduction, it's just a means of sharing DNA and it's uh, 
They have been uh, useful to bacteria in developing antibiotic resistance, for example, in sharing that, that, uh, those DNA strands that have made them resistant. Uh, fimbriae, you can kind of think of them as like roots that bacteria will use to embed themselves into, uh, say, a mucous membrane, for example, and also in their flagella, too. Uh, neutralization is, is what we do to block adhesion. So antibodies will coat these pathogens and they will prevent them from adhering to our cells and so now adhesion is blocked and so they can't gain access, can't release their toxins, can't multiply and, and make us sick. So here's a, a micrograph showing adherence and you can see the bacteria are those little round lumps there and and so they're growing in these little groups they're colonizing eventually that's going to be covered if it goes unchecked and you can see the the strands that are sticking out of the the bases of those lumps of bacteria uh, those would be the fimbriae that are rooting the bacteria into this substrate which i assume is most likely a mucous membrane so biofilms a uh, major component of of this chapter a major um, a major topic of pathogenicity. So what is a biofilm? Well, bio means life film means it's, a, it's layers of. So these are masses of microbes that are attached to a surface and it greatly increases pathogenicity. And in about 70% of all infections, there are biofilms. How much, it, it increases their pathogenicity by, in so many ways. Um, and we'll talk about that, but let's look at what it's made of. So the slime is primarily made of polysaccharides with DNA and proteins that are being shared amongst all the members that are growing within this biofilm. And biofilms can be not just one species of bacteria, in fact, not just one group of life. You can have bacteria, algae, for example, living together in a biofilm. But uh, typically, you know, you have the the bacteria sticking with with them, and but there may be other life forms that are uh, benefiting from the formation of this biofilm. The microbes are connected to each other. They can chemically communicate with each other. They can transfer DNA. They can share nutrients. When they're alone, there's none of this going on. Whenever the cells are by themselves and there aren't any buddies around, they do not carry out these these cellular processes. It's only when they're in a biofilm that they do this. They have a complex chemical composition, so they start to produce compounds and chemicals that they would never otherwise produce on their own. And so these, these chemicals get produced, released, they bond together, they make this chemi complex chemical soup that the biofilms live in. They're resistant to immune systems, disinfectants, antibiotics, how much more resistant? About a thousand times more resistant. They become a significant problem on internal medical devices. Patients who receive these medical devices, there's always uh, concern for a biofilm to form on these catheters and stents and mechanical heart valves. You get UTIs, for example. It's the number one hospital acquired a nosocomial infection or UTIs. Why? Because biofilms form on catheters, usually staphylococcal biofilms. They're problematic on contact lenses as well, so you have to be careful with those, making sure that they're being cleaned regularly uh, to prevent the formation of a biofilm and then leading to conjunctivitis or uh, something worse. Some examples, plaque on on our teeth, pool, algae, shower, scum, and flock. Flock is an encouraged biofilm in water treatment facilities in order to break down our waste. Now, all this description, I should mention, of biofilms, it sounds like gloom and doom, like biofilms are the worst. They are enemy number one, and that's not the case. In terms of pathogenicity, yes, I mean, that's this is the number one way that they are pathogenic, but there are biofilms everywhere in nature and the biofilms are extremely important to say for the agricultural industry but not even man-made things biofilms are very important just in in ecosystems themselves they create a balance within an ecosystem that 
is healthy for the ecosystem. So if it's an aquatic ecosystem, there are biofilms everywhere within a pond or a lake or, or an estuary, for example, and those biofilms are beneficial. In, a, in an ecological sense, they are. Um, but remember, this chapter, again, is, is about the bad stuff, pathogenicity. And so that's what we're looking at. But I don't want you to think that biofilms are the worst ever. Um, they're very beneficial in so many other ways, but we're looking at how they create disease. Um, how do we stop biofilms from forming? Because they're a major problem, especially within hospitals, for example. So we can apply antimicrobials to surfaces that will prevent the biofilm from forming in the first place. As you can see in the picture to the right, what's happening there, as I've shown this five-stage process. It's a continual one. I mean, it's it's not that clear cut and delineated, but you start out with a few cells and they start to conglomerate and multiply and divide. Uh, and then they begin to produce these chemical compounds that give a three dimensional shape to it. It's like a high rise apartment complex where the bacteria are thriving in there and they're protected by the biofilm. Um, now, the, the picture below there with the, those five black and white micrographs, they, they don't really serve justice to. You can't really tell. I guess you can see that it's looking a little thicker as it moves on, but the, the, um, the schematic at the top kind of gives you an idea of, of what's going on here. And I'll, I'll show you one on, the, on a, another slide here that, that shows it under microscopy. How the, the three-dimensional form of the biofilm takes shape. Um, which it does, and, and eventually uh, the, the biofilm becomes a, a community of bacteria, and eventually it gets to the point where it can't support that, the, that many members of the community, and so some bacteria leave, as you can see in that picture there. After number five, they take a trip, and they head out, and they form a new biofilm, and then they all kind of conglomerate together. So applying antimicrobials is going to prevent the the biofilm from even getting past stage one. We can inhibit microbes ability to in initiate quorum sensing. So what is that quorum? A quorum is like when you take a vote and, and the, the votes are registered and then you have a quorum. You have to have a certain number of people, for example, to hold a meeting. And if there aren't enough people there, you can't hold a meeting because the bylaws say you need a hundred people, but sorry, there are only 99. So this is what microbes do. They count each other. And, and if we can inhibit this ability for them to count each other and then have an idea of how many microbes are present, they won't begin forming a biofilm. And this was, there was a ton of work done by this. And I'm not sure if she was the discoverer of quorum sensing, but Bonnie Bassler, who, um, is at Princeton University, or was, I think she still currently is at Princeton. Um, she did some work on this in the 90s. There's a great TED talk by her, um, and uh, she explains how she discovered quorum sensing in bacteria. She started with a, a marine bacterium and noticed that in uh, small numbers, they didn't glow. They, 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 there was no glowing in the dark, but I don't know if it was by accident, um, but they, whenever the, the bacteria started to multiply and, and divide and reproduce, they, they glowed. Um, and so she started following this and then realized that this could be a way to control bacterial growth. If we inhibit their ability to count each other, to talk to each other, um, that their numbers would stop and their numbers would not increase because they think they're lonely. I'm the only one out here, so I'm just going to... And so then they wouldn't produce their toxins. If they don't realize, and I use that term loosely, if they don't realize that there are other bacteria around them, then they don't release toxins. And she did this in, in mice. She figured out a way to to block their ability. I, I assume it was through competitive inhibitors, preventing their enzymes from, from, from picking up chemical signals that the other bacteria were trying to send out into the dark. Is anyone out there? Um, and if the receptors did not pick up these uh, chemical signals, then the bacteria just assumed there was nobody there. 
Um, and as a result, they didn't produce their toxins. And she did. She tested this on mice, and she found that when she inhibited the bacteria, uh, when their ability to quorum sense, the mice lived. When she did not inhibit their ability to quorum sense, the mice died. So they they released their toxins because they realized that they were there was a whole gang of them, and so they started producing their toxins, and and the uh, unfortunate mouse then died. But if their ability to um, know that there were loads of them there, if they didn't know they were all part of a gang, then they didn't release toxins, and the, the mouse lived. So, a yeah, great discovery. Amazing discovery. Watch the video. It's, on, it's a TED Talk. It's by uh, Bonnie Bassler, and um, it's on biofilms. You can find that very easily online. Um, we can use lactoferrin. It's a compound that binds iron. See, uh, Fe in ferrin, Fe, the chemical sim symbol for iron. So anytime you see that in a, in a scientific term, it's going to most likely, almost always, being re referring to iron. Compound that binds iron, thereby preventing aggregation of microbes. So if they don't get their iron, which they need for their metabolism, they can't reproduce. A couple of pictures of biofilms that you may be familiar with. That's biofilm on a stream bed. And you can see on the top, it's all green. Those That would be algae. Uh, underneath that then would be bacteria. Loads of them. Billions upon billions. Just in that picture, easily. <laughs> billions upon billions of bacteria. But it makes sense that the algae would be on top because they're the photosynthesizers, so they're capturing the sunlight. But underneath that uh, would be bacteria. And if you've ever walked across a stream in bare feet, um, which I do often, it's very, very slippery. Um, and w what's causing the slipperiness? Well, they're biofilms uh, that, uh, that you would be walking on. One a picture on the right, there's a micrograph of plaque, which would be a kind of a complex combination. The, the main culprit is Streptococcus mutans and uh, some Actinomyces species, and then this uh, kind of gummy polysaccharide called dextran, which is used in a in a variety of ways that, that we use it in, in many products, but in particular on our teeth, um, it's a complex polysaccharide that's that's made uh, and uh, from sucrose and uh, along with other sugars as well. Um, but with the presence of Streptococcus mutans and Actinomyces species, um, this forms plaque then on our teeth, which then They'll produce an acid, which breaks down the enamel, which leads to cavities, which then you go to the dentist and have that whole unpleasant experience. Uh, so plaque of biofilm on our teeth. And uh, the picture on the right, uh, I referred to this earlier, this is fluorescence microscopy, and uh, you can ignore the caption. The only reason why I put this on here was that you could see the three-dimensional shape of the biofilm. See how it grows up? It looks like a like a bomb going off. You got the the smaller uh, groups on the fringes there and in the center you have the high-rise apartment complex of these millions of cells that are, are growing in this biofilm and, and uh, communicating with each other producing chemical compounds um, that they otherwise wouldn't produce while they were on their own. Um, the two on the right I just wanted to show you biofilms within water lines. The one at the top was a uh, a water line leading into an apartment complex and the, uh, the residents of the complex were complaining about low water pressure and uh, they tried to solve it in a number of ways till finally they dug up one of the mains leading into the apartment complex and this is what it looked like inside so hence the reason for the decreased water pressure how would you like to have that in your water lines um, the bottom one is is from a uh, that was just from a a house, a water line leading into a house, and it was for a product that said, well, break down all biofilms in your water lines, and so they were showing an example. This is what your water lines could look like inside. So that's a, a biofilm that is formed inside of a much smaller water line. So that's the end of part one. Uh, I'll pick up later with part two. Be looking for that. And uh, please don't forget to subscribe, like the video, and uh, most importantly, um, I, I hope this has been helpful and beneficial to you. So thanks for watching.